I'm Dave Brown. I'm the director of Tech Transfer at BYU. And we're going to begin by telling you just kind of the basics of what we do and then announce maybe some new initiatives or things you might not have heard of yet. So first, this is the, the mission-centric part of what we're doing. Uh, at BYU, you know, we have uh, very clear mission statements. And so we've worked to, to understand how Tech Transfer fits into that. And these are a few of the ways. We want to increase the university's impact by taking the research that ends up in publications and academic journals and getting it the next step, making it actual products and services that are changing people's lives. Basic research is worth doing, but if we can take it even further than that and affect people you know, out in the real world, that's great. Um, the second, we want to advance scholarship by increasing its societal impact. And then we want to enhance student experience by engaging students in real world activities. We have a lot of students involved in technology. At BYU, if you're running a lab of any kind, I bet you have students working in there. On most of the invention disclosures we receive, they're student inventors. BYU, as you know, I think, uh, shares 45% of revenue from commercialization with the inventors. And many of our inventors pass some of that through to the students. So that can be really meaningful for them as well. We have last semester, we had 19 students working at Tech Transfer in one capacity or another, a couple of internship teams. One team is doing validation. So when you give us your technology disclosure, we want to do some research to talk to potential customers of the eventual product and know whether this is something that people really want or maybe it needs to be repositioned in some way. So we have a team that does that. We have another team that does marketing internally to students. So they'll be over in the Tanner building with a booth signing people up for our mailing list. We have a mailing list of 800 students who are interested in tech transfer. And when we send the messages, we get, an, uh, what, about a 60% open rate. So they're very engaged. If you've ever done email marketing, that's like twice what you'd expect. And uh, they really want to learn more about what we do. Last week, we did a test with students where I thought, you know, it's spring semester. How engaged are they? Are people checking their email? Are they on campus? So we just set out to come by the office for tacos on Tuesday. And so between noon and one, we had like 50 or 60 students come through for that. We sat and talked about tech transfer and it was great. Really fun to work with. Then we have some other students we employ. One of the missing pieces historically in tech transfer has been taking your infections and reducing them to physical objects that potential licensees can understand. So now we have a couple students who create prototypes. They work with Ben Morris in our office to actually create devices, including really complicated things. They have one they're working on now that measures the, uh, the inside of corn stalks to see if, if weevils have gotten in there or whatever, whatever creature gets in there. And so they've actually created the device that goes around it. It has GPS features and like a digital interface and everything. It's like a really good first generation commercial product. So that's just an example of the sorts of things we do. Okay, lots going on with students. We're gonna talk more because there's another way students engage with us, which is by launching companies. More about that in a minute. If you wanna support faculty members with intellectual property questions, questions about law and business or whatever else. I'm an attorney, uh, Adam Stevens in our office is a patent attorney. We don't do our patenting in-house, we hire outside firms to do that. But if you have questions about intellectual property, you don't have to sit in the lab wondering, just call us. We'll get, we'll get it to Adam or me or someone else. And we don't have to set up a special meeting with outside attorneys, just talk to Adam. So I'm glad we can provide that. And then finally, we want to champion unique mission-inspired innovations that stand out in the world. So I know as researchers, you're working on mission-inspired research. And we want to take that, again, a step further and get it out where, where people can see it and interact with it. All right, so this is the commercialization policy, kind of the traditional thing. Probably most universities would lay it out something like this. Uh, when, you're, when you're doing research, you invent something. So step one is disclosing it to our office. If you go to the resources section of our website, techtransfer.boe.edu, you can find an invention disclosure form. You can fill out a Word document or a PDF document. There's also a Google form version. So you could click on the link and just type in your stuff if that's easiest. We want to, we're working on user design for you guys, and we're very open to feedback. So if there's something about the process that feels awkward or tedious to you, please tell us. We want to improve that. Um, so next, once we receive your invention, we have to think about the intellectual property. What can we protect? Is there a potential patent here? If it's software, maybe we just rely on copyright. We need to make that sort of decision. If we decide that patenting is needed, that's something to, that our office pays for. We would hire outside attorneys. There is a little time investment on your part. You're going to have to have some phone calls explaining things to a patent attorney but we hired good ones, so that should be a good experience. The next, we can market the technology. Like I say, we will have checked out some market validation, done some research to see if there's a, a market for what we have, and then we need to start actually talking to people more about that in a minute, but we meet with many entrepreneurs who are interested in looking at our technologies. Finally, let's assume that we find a match. We're, we're doing a deal. It's a startup company most of the time, or maybe we're licensed to a large company. Now we have to do the, the actual commercialization agreement. If you think about it, what's unique about tech transfer is, is really that step. That's the thing that can kind of only happen in our office. And we'd like to spend as much time as possible doing that step. And I do think we do a good job of it. 
Um, I won't bore you with the details unless you ask a question and want to know, but we do agreements, I think, quite differently than other universities do. Um, and I think that's effective. We're more versatile because, because of some unique aspects of BYU, we're able to do deals that other universities can't do. And then finally, uh, collecting and distributing revenue. At this point, I'm referring to David Campbell. He's, um, uh, he's our controller, and that is a big project, like making sure that licensees are paying. These are often cash-strapped startups, making sure the money gets where it's supposed to go to the inventors and elsewhere. Uh, so it's a big project. All right, so this is the basic process. Like I say, any university would say this. So now let's get on to things that are a little bit different. All right, these are kind of new things we want to emphasize, and so I want to talk to you about them. Um, first, startup companies. We, are, we have an ambitious goal for launching startup companies this year. I think we're more or less on course with it. And uh, startup companies are important for a few reasons. Almost all job creation in the U.S. comes from startup companies. If you think about it, if you're a large company, if you're a mega candy bar company, and you want to become more profitable, do better for your shareholders, which you should want to do, then you basically have a couple options. You can reduce the cost of your product by reducing the quality of the ingredients. So maybe, you know, get a little cheaper filler for those candy bars, whatever it is. Or you can just do more with less people, like cut down the workforce. If you, if you lay off a department, the company just got more profitable. So major corporations have a, an incentive to reduce jobs. Uh, startup companies, on the other hand, have pretty much the opposite incentive. They're just trying to grace something. We just got to get as many people in here doing stuff as we possibly can. And that is why when you look at the numbers, almost all job creation comes from startup companies in the U.S. Tech transfer startups are, are a little bit special. You can do a startup company that creates jobs that no one really wants to do. I mean, we all, we all need unpleasant things done, but, um, but not all startups create awesome jobs. Tech transfer startups are a little bit different because these are startup companies that hire PhDs. We had a company exited last year that was started here. It's a DJ Lee's object recognition uh, company, Smart Vision Works, and they had something like 45 employees. And I believe the most of those were PhDs. Like these are, these are people earning good salaries, good qualifications, not every student at BYU is going to go out and start a company, but a high percentage of them are going to go out and work for a company that was started by someone else, hopefully one of our students from BYU. So those are good jobs. We want this to happen more. And then startup companies tend to be more innovative than established companies. A really common conversation you have when you work in tech transfer is you have a technology and you talk to Megacorp and they say, we've got to have it. We've got to have that technology. It's amazing. And then you say, okay, let's do the paperwork. And they say, no, 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 that's not how we do this. You need to start up the startup company first and succeed with that, and then we'll acquire the startup company. And I'll say, but I can't guarantee the startup company is going to be acquired by you. It might be acquired by your competitor. And they'll say, well, that's a risk we can take. Well, what we can't do is take risks on unproven technologies. So if that's not 100% the case, you definitely can license uh, technologies to, to major corporations. We do some of that. But startups are an important way to get innovation out into the marketplace. There's one startup, a type of startup that we particularly like, and that is a student startup. Their views have gone back and forth on this. Not all tech transfer offices would, would agree with our perspective on this. Some people feel like, well, we don't want students to try something that doesn't work. You know, they see failing with a startup company as being bad for a student. We don't really see it that way. We want our startup, co startup companies to succeed, but this is a very safe place for a student to try something and fail. So let me tell you about one of our failures. Uh, one of our students who worked in the office a year ago found a technology in our office that he liked. And so we licensed to him. So... Uh, he went out to start the startup company. We connected them with a third-party company that kind of provides support for startups. Think of them as an accelerator. So they were providing accounting, legal, marketing sort of advice. And he worked with them for a few months, and the technology just didn't make it. The validation didn't pan out. There weren't as many consumers as we thought. So that company did not succeed. And so where is he now? Well, he got a company with that, a job with that accelerator company, and he's quite happy with that. And it's doing really well for him. This actually launched him into a career that he really likes. So I'm going to count that as a success, even though the startup company didn't actually succeed. However, I should point out also that tech transfer companies succeed at a far higher rate than the average startup company. You hear that 90% of companies fail, and that is true. Like 10% succeed. Even for very difficult technologies, like medical startup companies, if you have a, a university technology, your odds of failure are 60%, or 40% odds of success. You've quadrupled your chance of succeeding by using a technology here. Now, why is that? Well, think about your own lab and research that you're doing. Which technologies do you disclose to my office? Probably the ones that panned out, right? So you might follow like 10 different, you might have 10 different research projects and nine of them just didn't do quite what you wanted. The one that you did is going to make it to our office. So there's already been the selection. Like we've already selected out the losers. We have the winners. And then those are the ones we're trying to get the market. So if you're an entrepreneur looking at technologies, that's a pretty compelling, compelling thing. And bear in mind, we probably invested hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars in these technologies. So it's, it's a good start. 
Um, another thing that's great for students is the other supports we have at the university. There's the Rollins Center south of campus. They have a validation grant. Every student should go and get $500 to validate a technology. Why wouldn't you do that? That's just a good educational experience. I don't understand being a business student and not trying to launch a company. You might as well. If that goes well, if you do the $500 validation grant, then they have a follow-on traction grant, which I think is $1,000 or $2,000 to kind of scale up. We have other resources. We're connected with the Utah Innovation Center. If you want to, if you're starting a company with the University of Technology and you want to file for an SBIR grant, they will pay you three thousand dollars just for trucking. Just like, just fill out the application and they'll pay you three thousand dollars for that. Why? Because they want more of the federal grants to come to the state of Utah. So they're giving people a little financial incentive to do that. There are many other resources we could talk about. I'm just telling you, um, if I were 20 years old, I wanted to start a company. I think my best strategy would be to enroll in BYU and use the resources here. Tuition doesn't cost that much. Go to some classes, and you can start up a company. I think no one quite does that, but you get the point. Okay, launching a business provides practical lessons for students. Even if they ultimately decide they don't want to be an entrepreneur, there's there's this gulf between learning and doing right. And students who work in tech train us for, we've got not every student has done super well. Most of our students are amazing. But um, every once in a while, we'll have a student who... Uh, you know, might be a 4.0 student, but they want to be told every step along the way of what you do in the office. It's like, now uh, we're doing real world problems here. They're open-ended. I can't tell you what steps to take. That's what you're here for. And so um, just changing their mindset on that issue, I think is a great way to, to step into, you know, whatever job they ultimately pursue. And then finally, these startups help us prepare the next generation of business founders. Who is going to provide jobs and donations and everything else for the university in the future, like 20 years from now? Will it be people like me who went work for a law firm or somebody who went for an accounting firm or a doctor, engineer, whatever? Those are all great things to do, but that's probably not who does it. It's mostly going to be people who start new ventures. We need people to do that. We need some of our students to do that. So there's a huge priority for us. So far this year, we've launched five student startups. We have two that are just waiting for signatures. So let's say seven. And these are good startups. A couple of them from the get-go are venture backed. There's a venture capitalist financing it from the beginning. I would give those a very high chance of success. Um, a couple of the others are very bite-sized technologies that students can really get into. So I think those have an excellent chance. One of them isn't just a student. It's a student with, um, I think, an adjunct professor. And it's an AI technology. They don't want me to talk about it. It's great. I would give them a pretty high odds of success. So I think our student startups this year are going well. We're going to do a bunch more. So, so stay tuned for that. All right. So another emphasis, um, the dream in tech transfer is no longer a dream. But the dream nine months ago was, what if we create a social media platform where we can just present our technologies and there will be enough entrepreneurs watching that someone will just grab them. And so we start doing a podcast and we've created some other content. This is just, I'm just showing you some YouTube numbers. And actually, this is kind of unfortunate because the la last week has been really good. Like the chart should be, should be up a bit. But, the, uh, but anyway, this is growth over time. If any of you are interested in starting a podcast some, at some point, this is, this is how it works. You're, you're shouting into the void for six months and then finally a few people start listening. And so... We're at a point where um, when we post an episode now, it gets between, I, I would say, like 500 to 800 views in its first week. So I don't know if that sounds good. We're pretty happy about it. But a year from now, it's going to be 10 times that. And when we get things in front of enough eyeballs, we will get licenses from them. Uh, so far, we've done four special episodes where we have a videographer come in. We sit down with a professor, talk about the technology. We have a prototype because our prototype students can create that. And, and then we kind of display that so that it will be licensed. Of those four episodes, three of the technologies were licensed immediately. Like people saw the episode and, and licensed them. The other one, we're kind of in talks, and that's our most recent one. So um, I think I think it will go well. I think we'll get it licensed. And over time, this should get better. We have a number of different systems for getting our technologies out there, but this is kind of an exciting one. So what does this mean for you? So if you're doing research and you think, what we're trying to do here is take abstract ideas and make them concrete for people so entrepreneurs can see them and be excited about them, and that seems to work. So if there's some aspect of your research that you think is visual, visual that we could show off or that we could prototype or something like that, that would be a good candidate for a video. If, if it's useful for you to do an episode and get in front of people, I'm happy to do that. Uh, so just let me know. We've had some great guests. Because we have more viewers now, we can get better guests this past week. We had Andrew Krauss, one of the co-founders of InventRight, and it was a great episode. He talks about how to license to major corporations, step-by-step, -step, really useful, really educational for students, I think. Uh, like I say, this is YouTube. We also have people listening on Spotify, and I think some people are listening on x.com. We're still kind of working through that platform and understanding it. But um, anyway, we're going to keep going with that. It has been a good experience. Okay, finally, uh, next new emphasis is uh, SBIR, SBIR grants. So I've mentioned those a little bit. I think you're familiar, but in case you're not, these are small business 
something, something, incentive reward, something. What's that for? Innovation research. Innovation research, thank you. Small business innovation research grants. And so how it works, we did an episode with Linda Cabrillas, who's head of Utah Innovation Center, and she helps people apply for these. Um, how it works is you apply, the company applies, there needs to be a startup company, and they get an initial grant, I believe it was $250,000 or thereabouts in most cases. For that initial amount, I believe two thirds is supposed to be used by the company. So potentially a third they would put back into your lab for research. The follow-on grants can be large. They can be millions of dollars and those can be split. The company has to do 50% of the research in-house. The other 50% they could put in your lab potentially. So we see this as being a good thing for professors and we've had some great experiences. Obviously for startup companies, this is great. Some of the big companies in Utah that you think of as startup successes, went through a series of SBR grants. That's how they got it. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, the reason you would really like that is because then you're not diluting equity. You're kind of saving your equity for when the company is worth more. And uh, but it, it gets a lot of tech companies off the ground. So let me tell you what this is. So this is Quilify. Quilify AI, I'm not endorsing them, but we are using them. And they're, uh, they were founded by a couple of BYU alums. And what they're doing is they're using AI tools to identify SBIR opportunities. So we had we said, well, we have... We license a high percentage of our technologies, but because patents last 20 years, over time you build up an inventory, right? So we have about 600 technologies that we could license out, and we keep those in a Dropbox and Box folder, redacted versions of them. So if someone's interested in looking at technologies, they can sign a non-disclosure agreement with our office, and we'll give them access to those, and then they can just go through them. In the Box folder, they're kind of sorted by topic area, which makes it a little easier, but people can look through those. So what we're adding is, thanks to Qualify, another folder that has an SBIR report for every one of those. So far, we have like 15 of them, but give us a couple months and we'll have all 600. And it's AI generated, but it'll list um, typically maybe like eight to 12 SBIR grants that seem like a match for this technology. And then what's great about it is for each one, the AI will uh, have an opinion, a couple of opinions about how to position the technology for that opportunity. So as a researcher, you can look through and say, uh, I don't think I'm a match for that. And then you read the AI, then you're like, oh, well, if I... If I approach that, that angle, maybe it would work. And so we want entrepreneurs to look and see the opportunity and apply for SBIR grants and get a funding, which would be good for the university and make the, the uh, startup companies way more likely to succeed as well. All right, so finally, just an overview of the staff. Um, I've talked about myself a bit. So like I say, I'm an attorney, not a patent attorney. I am the software lead. Most of our software technology commercialization goes to startup companies. In, within the tech transfer space, the, the outliers to the extent it matters, kind of the business outliers are life sciences and software, but mostly life sciences. So you think of pharmaceuticals that come out of universities, increasingly pharma companies are looking at universities to do that research. But um, software occasionally does well, and we've had several of our recent exits have been software companies, and so that is great. Uh, Bennett Mortensen is our engineering lead, and he came, he had a prototyping business. He came through mechanical engineering, got his master's degree here, then he went and did a prototyping business. So. Uh, we were looking on that InventRight website. He was looking through some of the success stories, and he found a product that he'd actually created. <laughs> Someone had had him prototype, and then they went and uh, I think they, they might have gone on Shark Tank, but anyway, they commercialized the technology. So he's been out there doing real-world prototyping. He has a couple students working for him now. Over time, we're going to scale that up and have more. We might have an intern team this fall doing that too. Uh, the more we can reduce things to physical energy, the better. He's also, because of his experience, he, he has a pretty good feel for IP issues as well, which is nice. Okay, Adam Stevens, he was at Curtin McConkie for 18 uh, years, and then he joined us last September. We we're really lucky to get him, and he's he knows his stuff. He's our life sciences lead. That was kind of his area as a patent attorney as well. And so, like I say, if you have patent questions, you don't have to wonder. You can just call Adam. Okay, Jennifer's here, our relationship manager. I could let you introduce yourself, but I will introduce you. So, um... In terms of activities and, and engaging with faculty and others on campus, we're doing way more than we've done in the past. So we do a business plan competition each semester. It's unique. It's different for BYU. There's another student thing we're doing. But um, this last spring, what we did is the business plan competition was we presented a technology, one of ours, that we felt had been positioned wrong. It was not, for some reason, that it failed validation. There just wasn't quite a market for it. And the competition was reposition this. Tell us where this would be a good fit. And the, the winners did a great job. And so we do a couple of competitions like that a year. Uh, we also did uh, patents and pizza a month or two ago. That's a chance to just come and sit down with patent attorneys and ask them questions. In the fall last year, we, we had a presentation about these SBIR grants. We'll probably do that again. And we're open to other things that you want to learn about. So if you tell us, 
I don't know where to learn about this business issue or commercialization issue or whatever. Just tell us that and we'll, we'll find someone who can help us, help us present on that. All right. Um, so Jennifer's doing a uh, relationship manager. She works a lot with the interns too. They do different types of outreach. And then, like I said, David Campbell's our controller, uh, came from the industry and is great. Accounting things have gotten smooth and I think he's addressed probably most of your concerns already. But if not, I know he's willing to. So, okay, that's tech transfer. We are running so many experiments. I'm talking about the ones I'm excited about that are going well, but uh, on our, in our agenda on staff meeting, we have a list of experiments we're running. So we're gonna do some cool things. We don't know quite what yet, the, the new ones, but we're trying things out. So, okay, that's tech transfer. We love working with you guys. Thanks for letting us do that. Uh, before I turn the time over to Mary Jo, are there any questions uh, on your mind? Hi, Dave, thank you very much. This is a uh, fascinating. Um, so the area that I'm working in is um, partnerships with companies who are doing capstone projects. Oh, great. And one of the questions I have is just, what is the intellectual property situation there? Yeah. And which call do you with? Uh, computer science. Oh, computer science. Okay. So yeah, this is math. So um, engineering has been the most commercial about their capstone program in the past, right? And I know their agreements, whoever sponsored it, it's like a consulting agreement. They own the intellectual property outright. My impression has been that in, in your, I was going to say FizzMath, I'm not sure I know the new name yet, but in the new college, CPMS, whatever it is, they, um, uh, I think that's probably the case as well. So typically, we're usually not involved because usually the corporate sponsor is going to own the intellectual property, which I think is fine. I think that's a good deal and good for the students. There have been some cases where for one reason or another, that wasn't the case, either a department funded something or the company didn't want it or whatever, where we have the technology. So one example out of engineering is um, Heidi Cube. It's this... Uh, daycare foldable furniture that looks kind of cool and very visual. So we'll probably end up on the website sometime soon. But um, so that's why we're commercializing. There was another case where recently where someone funded like a no boil over pot. Um, Earl Lott did that in engineering. And uh, so he's, he wanted us to help him with commercialization. So we're working on that. So, so my point is there are exceptions, but generally the com commercial sponsor owns it, I believe. Is that the case though? Is that your experience? Yes, that's what I've ever seen. Um, I guess one of the questions is, I'm brand new here. I've done had multiple startups uh, in the past, but I'm trying to understand what would you consider a, um, a good invention disclosure off the dirt? Okay. Um, one that's, that's uh, a good opportunity to commercialize. So the, we're a little bit good at spotting opportunities. <laughs> so we occasionally we've had funding where we could give bridging funds to different technologies. And so we tried to pick the winners and, and put funding in. And uh, historically, we can look back and now say all those investments we got between a 6x and a 10x return. So it looks like we picked pretty well. But if we had chosen randomly, maybe we would have picked well too. I'm not sure. So um, I, I, we try to stay humble about our ability to, the ability to pick um, winners. I would say just generally, and this is something that, that we all should think of is uh, innovations that respond to a known market need. We have every once in a while, we'll have a, mark, a meeting with outside industry people where professors want to learn, okay, what does this industry actually need? Especially in the medical space, life sciences is into this because like we have some ideas, but if you're not a doctor, it's hard to know what doctors want. So if there's something where you know that you're spying to, to a need that exists, that's great. If you don't know, that's fine. Submit it anyway. And we'll do some market validation research to try to figure it out. But um, let's see, uh, larger market sizes is, is good in uh, in academia. And this is not a criticism. This is part of the, the wonderfulness of academia is that you can focus on obscure problems that affect a small number of people. Those are going to be, that's a good thing to do, but will be less commercial. So if it's a bigger target audience, having started startup companies, is there anything you would add? Um, Bill, I think we need to be more aware of that. You know, as we're, we're thinking about research, I think um, maybe one of the things you, that uh, I would love to see is having your office come and teach us that, as I'm back to a little bit more about, hey, as you're doing research, here are the things that you really should be looking at. And, you know, give us maybe some uh, briefings on, hey, here are some, uh, bring in an industry expert. Okay, hey, here are some of the, the major areas uh, and uh, problems that are in this. I would love to have that in my, for my students, but it's, it's yeah. um, that they did get more of a feel for where are the, the interesting problems that still need to attack. That's that's a really good idea. So I see David taking notes. So we'll we'll remember that. That's great. Um, thank you. And uh, we do present in classes. Often we're asked to to present, but it's usually about intellectual property. Um, if you had a, a situation though where you said, "Look, we'd really like to connect it," and the industry person who would talk to us about this subject, um, I think I personally am happy to help you track someone down. 
like we deal with a lot of people. So, um, so yeah, do please do reach out about that. That'd be fun to do. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Well, I think I'll turn the time over to Mary Jo, but um, if you have any other questions afterwards, we'll be sticking around. So thanks so much. Yeah.